hey, good afternoon, everyone. Um, hope you're having a good time with this event today, and hopefully um, there will be multiple takeaways for you uh, from these sessions. So in this um, next 40 minutes, uh, what we're going to do is we will concentrate on um, migrations at AWS, and we will specifically talk about uh, mainframe and modernization. Um, and John, John will be talking about that in the later half of the presentation. And I will be talking about the legacy applications migration to AWS platform. Uh, with that being said, my name is Kiran Kupa. I am a migrations SA based out of Dallas, Texas. And uh, uh, I'm accompanied with John here, who is a co speaker, and he'll be taking over the second half of the presentation. All right, let's get started. So what are we going to talk about today? Uh, we will be talking about migration methodology at AWS uh, and I will cover the legacy applications and um, John will be taking over and covering on the uh, my main trip migrations. Um, um, and so uh, so let, let's start with uh, what the AWS framework for migrations looks like real quick, because this is the fundamental approach for any kind of migrations going into the cloud, whether it be a legacy applications or whether it be um, um, standard applications that you want to move into the cloud. We essentially see this as a framework that is based on previous customer experiences. And what we try to do here is we created a very efficient and effective approach to migrations. And this essentially approach has about three different phases. So we have um, the first phase as SS phase and the mobilized phase and the migrate and modernize phase. And as you would see, in each of these phases, we have very specific activity that is assigned to each of these stages. And we've seen with customers that uh, having going through different phases and covering different activities essentially helps you um, accelerate your migrations and also reduce risk during the process of migrations. So I'm not going to be going over all different uh, options that are available in each phases, but again, this is a very customizable framework where, uh, depending on the customer's use case, we can always uh, plug and play different different things uh, in, inside this uh, inside inside these different phases. So at a very high level in the SS phase is where we are looking to create um, a, a case uh, for a change. And this essentially involves um, a fundamentally a rapid discovery. And the, and the idea for rapid discovery is like if you have many legacy applications or any applications in your data center for that matter, and more so important is for legacy applications, is when we want to understand what exactly the footprint looks like. Uh, not just in terms of uh, the number of machines and the resources, but also in terms of the dependencies of those applications and the details of what those applications are and what are the different paths to migrate into AWS Cloud. So this is essentially a rapid discovery to provide us with the base information that we need to carry out the migrations. So in the mobilized phase, there are again multiple stages or multiple activities, but the most important part of the mobilized phase is to come up with a migration plan. This is where we will look at your applications that we discovered. We try to identify what these applications are and what are the best tools uh, to pick and choose for the migrations. And then once we have that in the mobilized phase, we essentially do the migrations in the migrate and modernize phase. And we will talk through um, the different waves and wave planning and all other things that actually come in, in this, in, in this um, uh, area. Uh, with that being said, let me introduce to you um, the idea of 7R methodology. So with 7R methodology, this is not, not very new. This essentially is built on top of the five R's that Gartner coined back in 2011. So the idea of the 7R methodology is we take all the information that we discovered in the initial phase, we essentially run through the dependency mapping information, and then we choose different different routes for different applications. And as, as you would understand, like if you're moving out of a data center, not every application is going to follow the same path. So each one might have a little different path depending on the application, the complexity and the business need. So with 7R methodology, the, the first R essentially is of relocating. This is essentially taking something that is already inside your data center and simply moving it. This probably might not apply a whole lot for uh, legacy applications. Rehosting is another methodology where we're trying to do a true lift and shift, um, applies to a lot of legacy applications in, in the sense where if you have Windows machines uh, running uh, workloads that are fairly static and fairly old and you don't have a way to essentially refactor them, then re lift and shift probably might be the best one uh, to choose there. Then we talk about uh, things like replatforming, where we essentially try to determine the future platform, like, for example, moving from a, a legacy .NET application that's no longer supported. We want to pick up, pick and choose a different platform, like maybe um, uh, containers on AWS and, and things like that. So we essentially try to modify the infrastructure. We try to replatform and refactor those applications moving forward. The other R's are essentially repurchasing, fairly straightforward. If you all already have um, a, 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 an application that's already moving into the cloud, and if there is a SaaS offering, we definitely want to leverage that. And the other ones are refactoring, where we are trying to redesign the entire application. Uh, retain is something that, hey, if I don't want um, 
to do anything with this application, I can essentially just read it and keep it there. And Rintar is identifying an application that we no longer need, or we already found another alternative, so we just want to sunset this application. So those are different different um, uh, paths that an application could take. So with that being said, having the understanding of what the seven R's are, we essentially put them into certain buckets and we essentially filter them out through different different tools. So for each of, for example, Relocate has a certain set of tools that we can bring to table that will essentially help you migrate the tax duration. Um, similarly, Rehost and anything that is replatforming, repurchasing will essentially need a deeper dive. Um, as you would see, these are not straightforward where you put a tool and then migrate. There will be a lot of discussion around what kind of future architecture needs to go in place to make that work on, on the AWS platform. And the end of this uh, uh, wave planning workshop is usually a, a disposition that we've completed and decided on what are the migration waves and what are the things that we want to do. Now, what are the platform choices when it comes to AWS? When it comes to the application migration platform choices, so we essentially look at the compute uh, in sense, uh, where we have uh, services like Elastic Beanstalk, very popular for moving middleware applications like WebSphere applications into the cloud. Um, again, these are the supported operating systems, whether it be Linux or Windows, Beanstalk essentially supports those. Uh, the very, very popular or the most popular, I would say, is the containers. So essentially, AWS has um, uh, multiple options for running containers on the AWS platform, which could be Amazon EKS or ECS um, um, and, and Fargate as a variation for both of those. Now, we see a lot of customers moving their applications into containers, and the reason for that is because of the compatibility that they're not able to find the, the, the binaries for the installation and things like that. So essentially, we can help you containerize those workloads and move them into the cloud. And of course, uh, there will be, if you're decided to do complete refactoring, then you can move complete refactoring into the AWS cloud. So whenever we talk about migrating into the cloud, most customers think about, hey, let's go into the cloud and uh, do a refactoring and take the full advantage of the cloud operations, right? That is usually the sense that anybody would think of. But what we've seen with most of the customers is probably that is not the best idea because what will happen is when you try to do too many things at the same time, you either go into analysis paralysis or essentially you're 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 prolonging your migration cycles and usually is not not the best way to deal with so the, the best way uh, i would say is to try and see whatever you can lift and shift you just lift and shift and anything that cannot be lifted and shifted and once it's actually lifted and shifted into the cloud you can essentially do a refactoring but of course there are certain things that you cannot do a lift and shift like mainframes um, but we will cover mainframes and different methodologies in the second half when it comes to the database choices, um, AWS essentially provides you with multiple choices for databases as well. There is managed database for commercial databases like Oracle and SQL, uh, depending on your usage, depending on um, the, the amount of uh, control that you want to have on managing the databases. You can go with several different options, which also includes like self-managed databases running on EC2 instances, which is very typical of uh, running a, a database on a virtual machine. Now, cloud endure migration is a service that we see as a lift and shift service. This is primarily uh, what, what cloud endure does is it can take your virtual machine and can copy block, do a block level replication from any source, whether it be your uh, on-prem data center or whether it be a different cloud provider who has been essentially helping you manage uh, these as managed resources. So we can, so at a very high level, what Cloud India does is it does a continuous block level replication. And on the left hand side, if you see, it's, it could be a data center or any other cloud provider. We take that information and we essentially copy those disks onto AWS Cloud. And in this, what we do is we essentially create volumes or EBS volumes for those particular machines. And once you're comfortable that you want to, uh, that you want to do uh, a production rollout, then there are various different options like blueprints within uh, Cloud Endure and will essentially give you the exact same machine in, in the target subnet or target network area wherever you want that machine to be launched. So the idea of this Cloud Endure migration is, is, is truly a lift and shift. So uh, it, has, it supports both Linux and Windows operating system and uh, operating systems and um, the idea is we are not changing anything. This is probably the, easy, the fastest way of moving your applications into the AWS cloud. And once you have your legacy applications in AWS cloud, you can essentially spend more cycles in refactoring once you get used to the AWS platform. The, the next um, service I want to quickly talk about is uh, EMP, uh, which, which we call as end of support migration program for Windows Server. So Windows Server 2003 has been end of support since like July 2015 and, and Server 2008 has been like sunsetted back in like 20, in Jan, in Jan 2020. So however, many customers still find themselves struggling to upgrade applications that are running on this end of life operating systems, right? 
And the primary reason for this is that legacy applications are often not supported on the newer versions of the operating system or which will require these applications to be refactored. And refactoring is fairly expensive a lot of times. And, and customers often find that the expertise to rewrite these applications is no longer available in their environment. So it's, it's, it's way more expensive. So the idea of this is essentially like if you want to take an application that is running on a Windows 2003 server, uh, we provide you with different paths on how to migrate that into the cloud. So in this example, um, so the, the workflow for this would be uh, initially uh, in step number one, what you would do is you would download the EMP compatible package um, uh, from the AWS website. And then you essentially install the package builder to the packaging machine. And in this example, we are using the server 2003 um, um, or 2008 um, as shown in step number two here. Then uh, depending what the legacy application is, so we have two options. If you have, there is a standard packaging. If you have the installation media, we can help you package the entire application. And uh, if you don't have an installation media for an application, we can help you reverse package the system as well. So essentially it's called reverse packaging. So the idea is once we take these packages and once we essentially package your application, you can create a new package and, and copy to a destination server in step number four. And once you do this, you essentially move that application into a, a right VPC and the destination server with the right operating system or the newer operating system. In this case, it's let's say it's 2019 Windows operating system. And all you have to do is simply attach a role and deploy this application on a Windows server. So think about in terms of these applications are like legacy applications where you don't have installation media or have installation media, but cannot refactor. Uh, this will essentially give you that quicker migration path. And then you can think about refactoring at a later stage or maybe replacing the software with something else at, at, at a later point. Uh, essentially helps with the migration cycles. The next service I want to quickly talk about is uh, called as app to container. Um, so app to container essentially helps customers to transform their legacy applications running on virtual machines into containers that can be easily deployed into ECS or EKS with very minimal effort. So the idea here is to if you have applications that um, it are very difficult to do installation from scratch or uh, you are having difficulty converting them into modernized, modernized application. Uh, App to container will essentially take that and convert them into uh, containers uh, and, and you don't have to do a lot of heavy lifting in this case. So at a very high level, the way that app to container works is that um, if you have like you can have applications running on virtual machines on prem or on EC2 or even other cloud providers, you can take those applications there are two sets of applications, by the way, that we support essentially it's um, ASP.NET applications running on IIS server or it's Java based applications running on Spring Boot, Tomcat, JBoss, WebSphere or WebLogic. So the app to container, what it does is essentially takes an extract from those machines and creates a Docker container for you. And this Docker container can also be lifecycle managed We're using our other uh, CI CD pipeline services, where we can take that and provide you with a full lifecycle management. And the idea is to take this Docker container and deploy it into a target architecture where we'll be running ECS and EKS and ECR. So um, essentially a very quick way of running into uh, containers. At the same time, uh, we, so this is not a service that's available in the console as a GUI format. This essentially is a CLI tool. So uh, we provide you with a CLI tool for the end-to-end -end workflow of converting your application into containers. Uh, it has two flavors, uh, Windows tool and Linux tool. So essentially these are the support operating systems, fairly straightforward and essentially makes that moving to containers much faster. So with that being said, um, I'm gonna stop here and I'm gonna uh, hand this over to John so that he can actually talk about mainframe migration methodologies. Great, thank you. Um, Ron, can I uh, get control of the screen there? Uh, yes, I will make that change right now. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Ron. Can everyone see my uh, title screen here? So make sure it's always the double check. Yes. Say so yes. Okay, great. So again, thank you, um, thank you, Kieran, for uh, another amazing presentation. I yeah, I, I want to thank Ron as well for organizing this. And every time I come to these, um, I I I learn so much. I've learned so much so far, and I'm looking forward to learning more um, for the future, the upcoming sessions. So again, thank you again. So. Um, so just real quick, so uh, I'm going to cover mainframe modernization, some of the patterns and recommendations we have um, here at AWS. Uh, 
I know I'm between you and a hundred dollar gift card drawing, so I won't belabor the point. So uh, I'll give a quick background on myself. So um, John O'Donnell here, I'm a senior solution architect in AWS. Um, I'm in the Pennsylvania, New York area. Um, and I'm the mig migration lead for the Northeast US. So basically anything that deals with migration, um, whether it's mainframe, midsize, x86, Sun Solaris, um, those are areas where I um, intersect here. Um, I, I focus on helping enterprises, you know, migrate and modernize. And one of my uh, customers was actually was the uh, a keynote speaker with at, in 2019 at reInvent with uh, Werner Vogels, who's our CTO, uh, about some of the work that I had done um, for them involving containers, et cetera. Um, and before this, I, I like to see my friends from Microsoft here. I was at Microsoft. I was at Dell. And I was at GlaxoSmithKline, where I actually led the first... Um, we were the second customer to move to what was previously called Microsoft uh, BPOS D, um, which is now Office 365, which you'll also be familiar with. So enough about me, let's get started. So if you're on this call, you probably know this answer, but sometimes you have to educate folks, you know, what is the mainframe? Um, so it's it's basically IBM Z series is kind of really the focus that that we look at from um, running ZOS, running different subsystems, et cetera. Um, 80 to 90% of all the mainframe market is is, is IBM, their Z series, right? Um, that stands for zero, Z stands for zero downtime. And it's truly just absolutely amazing system. Like the, the people that designed this um, before many of you were born um, just made an incredible system, right? I mean, they're built with spare components, hot failovers, and you know, it's continuous operation. These things just won't die. Um, I think what's what's really amazing too is that it does have full backward compatibility with System 360, System 370. From I mean, System 360, just think about it, was announced and rolled out in 1964. So that is a you know a little bit older than me, but not too much older, right? And the System 370 came out in the 70s. But just think about code that's over 50 years old is can still run on these these systems, right? Um, and I think that's really the amazing thing. It could run unmodified five decades later i don't think anything will ever surpass the value of, of the, th that amazing type of um, functionality so are mainframes still in use yes next question so you know i don't have to read this to you but yeah banks retailers the largest airlines and more um you know if you're a member at costco for example the wholesale shopping club everything runs through their mainframe and they look up stuff you know it's a, literally a green screen i see in the store there when i go there um but Pretty much any enterprise, big customer you work with, um, even smaller customers um, are going to run either a mainframe or, or, you know, an AS400, like a mid-range, right? But they're working on systems like this forever. Why? Because they just work and they're they're amazing systems. So I'm going to throw a quiz here. I don't know if I can see the chat. Maybe, Ron, you could just throw out some numbers there. So I'm going to have a little, little fun quiz here for the folks on the line. Um, how many lines of COBOL code is there on an average mainframe? And the def definition is from our, you know, the customers we work with. So I don't know if folks can throw a chat out there and maybe read some out, but um, just like to kind of get the audience uh, pulse on that if we can. Nope, nobody, nobody knows. Okay, all right, we'll just keep going then. So the answer is no one. Okay, last chance. All right. Um, hey, John, Dietrich yeah. said it's billions, and, okay. and say from Albertson saw it was 15 million. Okay, all right. Very, well, somewhere between those is, is the number, so this is like the price is right. So if you are um, under but close, you win. So um, the gentleman from Albertson's is the winner. So the answer is, on average, 21 million lines of code. You know, and you're thinking about like COBOL code. I wrote COBOL code in grad school. Um, COBOL is a very verbose language, but 21 million lines of code is a lot, right? And, you know, you, people were paid to write K-locks of code. You were actually paid in the old days to write more code, right? You know, a thousand lines of code. Um, 21 million is a lot. So great answers. Thank you, everybody. Um, and this makes sense, right? Because, you know, mainframes are the system of record for many companies, right? Like um, most critical workloads, they've been running for well over 10 years. I work with a customer, I'll highlight it later, who's run it for over 30 to 40 years. Um, so be, you know, understanding that these things have been there, some of these systems have been there forever. They could be running code that's over 50 years old, and there could be 
hundreds, you know, 20, 50, 100, whatever the number is, millions, zillions of lines of code, how do, how do we get started? How do we start modernizing this? So I'll cover some of the, you know, the drivers really quick. So obviously, um, why move off of mainframes or why change how you use mainframes today? Um, we're talking about cost, right? So like, Running a mainframe is not inexpensive. Um, you know, IBM uh, is working to kind of make licensing more palatable for people, but it's still it's 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 a pretty big capital expense to to run these type of systems. Um, licensing support, just the care and feeding of these systems, um, it, it's it's not cheap, right? Um, agility, um, the, for the ability for companies to quickly address um, customer demands in like in days or a week that doesn't happen the mainframe development cycle just is so much slower it's obviously more resilient in some ways but it's also very slow um you know tech debt um i don't know if anyone's looked at i mean i've dealt with like tech debt from even more modern systems and it was a nightmare right so just thinking about like if you, you have 50 you know 20 30 40 years of code piled on top of each other some of the original developers of moved on from this life, right? Um, good luck on trying to, you know, um, uh, fix that original code. Um, you know, digital, uh, customers wanna to move to digital platforms, right? So the web and, you know, I give a use case, the web and mainframes don't mix very well. They can be thunked together. And I think there was a great presentation about the security aspects and those type of things a little bit earlier, um, but they don't mix. It's sometimes oil and water in that, uh, uh, that, that mixture. Um, Skills, trying to find people that can do skills and support legacy systems in any system, whether it's a mainframe or other languages, right? Like the, the gentleman from Microsoft was covering, right? Um, good luck, right? Like trying to find people to do that for you, trying to get college students to kind of train up on this is, is very difficult, right? So just this is a skill shortage overall. Then analytics, again, this was mentioned earlier by our friends at Microsoft. Um, unlocking that data, getting value from data. Um, the, the data, the information behind that data is, is uh, critical. So again, beating this dead horse here a bit, fixed costs four times higher than infrastructure, um, diminishing pool, mainframes are rigid, and the data is locked up. You just can't, it's there, but it's hard to get to. And trying to get data off a of mainframe um, without even consuming more MIPS or more processing, it, it, it's, you know it's a process in itself right so um so how do we start solving that right so what are some patterns um that we've seen um you know we have a database modernization practice within our professional services group within our solution architecture group as well we have some ringers right that came in from different industry groups that are absolute mainframe specialists and these are kind of the four um patterns that we've found to be very successful for customers so um, or less successful so we'll, we'll go into the details of that so augmentation so the first way that most companies just start connecting to the aws cloud is um, is via augmentation so this is adding capabilities to an existing platform it's not changing the platform the mainframe itself or you know the hosting model mainframe stays where it is so the, the, probably the easy, I say the, nothing's easy, but the easiest uh, of, of the items to kind of cover is uh, basically very simple, you know, it's backing up, right? If you're backing up your mainframe, you have virtual tapes, uh, you could actually some companies still run tapes, right? Um, you know, uh, they also, uh, I worked with a large financial services company that had to maintain it, maintain data basically indefinitely. Um, so very long retention periods, storing that on tape, shipping things to Iron Mountain, for example, right? Th those days are, that's that's the challenge to keep track of all that type of stuff, right? So in this pattern, we can take database, you know, say for example, DB2, data files from different you know, file system, and back those up into S3, which is our simple object storage, um, Glacier or Glacier uh, Deep Archive, right? Where basically you put something in Glacier, it stays there forever, it costs next to nothing to store hundreds of gigabytes and it's um, the, the nine of uh, 11 nines of durability as far as that type of storage. So you will not lose that data. That data will be there um, indefinitely, right? Um, and we do have things if this is kind of, you know, we have object lock, which essentially is, um, uh, think about if you remember write once, read many, like worm protection, right? It's a worm type of model where I'm going to write once to the 
write to this file can never be touched again, it'll be archived, but it can be read by different processes. So um, backup's a great way, archival is a great way to get started leveraging AWS. Um, analytics, another, you know, this is a, a great platform, as I mentioned a little bit earlier. Um, I want to unlock the value of the data, right? So AWS, we have a plethora of services, EMR, QuickSight, Kinesis, right? All these systems in a, in a data lake, right? can process that data that you have that's kind of sitting maybe in a latent form on the mainframe and really unlock a lot of really great value for that, right? So you're basically copying data from the mainframe, you're moving into a data lake in AWS, leveraging things like Kinesis, Pipeline, DynamoDB, which is our NoSQL database, to really gain more value from that from that data. Um, I will cover a, um, a, uh, a pattern, um, of this um, a a little bit later um, as far as how we how we implemented that. So new channels and new functions. So essentially, this is very similar to um, the analytics side, but basically, companies are looking new ways to do business. And you know, as the you know Kubernetes, everyone loves Kubernetes. You know EKS, right? Lambda, serverless, SageMaker, AIML, right? So getting data to those systems um, is really important. So um, you know trying to do these in a mainframe generally isn't even possible, right? Um, trying to do these things on premises when you're trying to scale up, as the as the SUSE you know uh, presentation covered it can get complicated, right? And, and expensive to do this on-prem. So moving this stuff, if, for example, is voice enabling mainframe data or data to a mainframe, right? I wanna have a financial services company. I want customers to change their um, portfolio. I can use Alexa, right? And once people have those in their house, right? Uh, to do things like that. So there's all sorts of great use cases for that. Um, again, with any of these type of initial patterns augmentation, data is replicated. So generally, this is a one-way push. It's it's you know read-only in the cloud. There's not usually a bi-directional type of ability to get data back and forth, just from the complexity and record locks and stuff like that. So just something to think about um, that you want to ensure that when you're taking data from the mainframe and putting it into any cloud, that you're taking care of that the data integrity um, from left to right. So now I'll go into um, uh, emulation. So emulation basically is, uh, if you're familiar with uh, VMware Hyper-V, you know, uh, that's what it is. It emulates uh, an operating system. Um, so the first pattern um, is mainframe hardware emulation. And really what this is, is this is taking um, a rehost, a lift and shift, as Kieran mentioned earlier, um, <clears throat> your mainframe operating system and moving it basically unchanged into EC2, um, which is our uh, virtual platform. Um, there are third-party tools that will emulate uh, ZOS, for example, um, and Unisys. Um, there is a limitation with IBM is you cannot run production workloads in emulation. So just be aware of that. But for test dev, anything other than that, um, it's a great way um, to to start you know start leveraging the power of the cloud. Um, there, uh, you know, th this doesn't really change things. We're just moving it. It's kind of like cloud indoor. We're moving it from point A to point B, but we're leveraging modern um, cloud computing software, and we can throw a lot more horsepower processes if we need to uh, by leveraging some of our larger and higher scale instances. As far as that, so use cases for this dev tests, as I mentioned. Um, you know, if, you, if your license supports it, just stay in sta stable stuff, you're never going to touch again, run it in this process. Um, you know, really looking at, you know, if there's an emergency data center shutdown, things like that. So there's all sorts of great uses for this, but this is just a simple lift and shift backup. Things don't change um, for the end user. And now kind of getting into middleware emulation. It sounds like lift and shift, but there's, there's a difference, right? So um, not every... Vendor will require this, but most vendors are going to take a recompile of the code, right? So basically, your code, your COBOL, you know, your different code sets are going to have to be. You're going to have to have the source. You're going to have to recompile those to operate on this new um, middleware emulator, middle, middleware emulator, right? Um, yeah, emulators, as you're familiar with, kind of um, uh, emulate 
uh, hate to use the term, emulate the operating system APIs, and basically that handles that processing, right? Um, but basically, you can port and recompile your source to run on x86-64 uh, processors running under Linux, right? Um, data like vSAM, QSAM, all the data formats can be moved into RDS, which is a relational database store. Um, and um, again, this is not necessarily cloud native, but you're kind of getting in the right direction and starting to be able to create different services within AWS where you can get some access to that data. And again, um, you know, this is a, a step in the right direction. Um, you know, this is kind of moving from hardware that you have on premise that, that may be going out of date. I had a use case when I was a Glaxo a client where we had a system literally running from the 50s, running our entire ERP system. I won't tell you how much money ran through that every day. Um, but when IBM says we're dropping support for this hardware, that takes a long time. Um, and it took us a long time to fix it, right? So, you know, this would be a great use case for something like that. I just want to get off of on-prem. I want to move it to, in, into the cloud and leverage this middleware emulation. Um, I don't want to change my code. I want to keep code as it is. I just want to recompile it, right? Another great use case. Um, and again, dev, te dev test is always a great use case for, for both these type of um, options. So let's cover uh, refactoring. So refactoring is basically changing your code from you know one language to another, right? So I'm going from COBOL to Java or to .NET, right? Um, Automated refactoring, I think that's the critical element. Um, you are basically, I need full access to the source code, so I can't can't change the code unless I have the code. Um, and it's not a manual rewrite, but it's automated, basically tools that vendors will go through. The, there's a bunch of vendor tools out there I'll cover in a little bit uh, that will go through there, will inspect your code, will kind of give you a score and a model and things like that and say, okay, we think that 99% chance of success for this one. This one may require some manual refactoring because there's some hard coding or stuff like that. That's what these tools do and they're really great. But again, think about going from COBOL to Java or C Sharp, excellent, excellent move to kind of get to a platform that your coders can uh, ma maintain. Um, you know, the, the green screen, a lot of those things um, don't necessarily go away with this, but there's web wrappers that can go around that. Um, and I would say, like the, the you know the really um, in, interesting part of this is that um, you know Java code, for example, is you can package those as REST services and make make that mainframe the data and the logic um, unlock that for for your customers or your internal consumers to use. Um, so, what would be a use case for automated refactoring? Um, you know, moving from basically languages that were written, you know, developed maybe in the in the 50s and 60s, COBOL, PL, you know, RPG, natural, some of the languages were discussed a little bit earlier, um, and moving them into a modern technology stack, right? So um, this does take time, this does take work, um, but the outputs, the outcomes for this um, are really very solid. So when you're done this process, and this does take some time, um, you will have a, a modern architecture where you can leverage the power of the cloud. So rewriting, okay, well, I don't want to pay all that money for automated tools. Why wouldn't I just rewrite the code, right? Um, well, here's why. Um, they fail, right? So um, very large uh, manual rewrites are train wrecks, right? And I'm just using that as the, you know, the vernacular. Um, you know, lift and shift, rip manual rewrites do not work. Trying to write rewrite millions of lines of code that there's no uh, documentation for, the people that wrote it have moved on, just, you know, just forget about it, right? And I'm just showing you the list here of just um, failure, absolute failures and tend to be like, uh, governments tend to be the worst at this, but they also have tend to have the oldest hardware. So um, we do not, again, we'll cover that, but. I don't recommend manually writing. Unless you get 10 lines of code, go rewrite it. You have 21 million lines of code. There's not enough people in the world that um, you know uh, that that you could hire to get this done in a, in, a, in a good way. And again, you don't want to be the person who recommends a rewrite and it costs you $200 million and the thing falls over. It's like that California person there or the Texan that's 367 $367.5 million and then nothing nothing happens. So again, horror stories, we don't want you to fall into those traps. 
So what are different, so comparing the patterns, right? And what do we recommend as far as like the best way for you to get value quickly from a mainframe leveraging AWS? Obviously, I'd, manual rewrites take forever and they cost a ton of money and they tend to fail. Um, legacy um, hardware emulation, um, you know, for non-prod, for ZOS, for doing development stuff, absolutely a great way to, you can do that really quick. Like you just go to the vendors, which I'll show you in a bit. You, you, you take your stuff, you move it over there, you throw your code in there and it starts running, right? So again, um, it's moved, it's not modernized, right? Uh, re, so rewriting is kind of covered, just don't do that. Don't, don't look at that. It takes years in the traditional waterfall model to do that. Again, strongly not recommended for that. Um, you know, repurchasing, um, you might think, well, geez, I just repurchase something, I do it. it might, that might be easy. If you worked in big companies, enterprises, just going through like the RFP and the approval processes and implementation and testing and requirement gathering, those take years, you know, years and years, right? Um, so repurchasing is not really a pattern that we um, we recommend. Um, augmentation, which I just covered a little bit earlier, um, you can do a lot in a short period of time, right? So I'm gonna actually cover a use case where this was used very successfully. Um, and just thinking about the kind of the mechanics, like just offloading MIPS from a mainframe, for example, could make all the difference in the world, um, save you a lot of money and also increase customer outcomes. Um, but the, the longer augmentation goes on, the more things that you augment, also the more kind of in, in stone the mainframe is, there's more tiebacks to it. So it's, it's, a, it's a great pattern if you're moving towards um, leaving the mainframe and going into the other patterns above here. So again, middleware, it's really the best, the middleware emulation is really the best known pattern. Um, it works very well. And again, don't quote me on the time, about a year, you can move an average mainframe over and that's the average mainframe is, you know, millions of lines of code, right? That's a lot, right? So um, we're seeing about a year for customers to do that. Again, your mileage may vary, but just kind of view this as guidance. Um, and then automated refactoring, again, that really just gets you like completely off the platform. Um, uh, <clears throat> it's a similar timeline. It's about a year, maybe two years, right, to do that, depending on your amount of code. But at the very end of that, with automated refactoring, you're a completely cloud native company. You've taken, you've got things off the mainframe, you moved everything, or at least those, you know, the majority of your workloads into cloud native, and you can start taking advantage of all the great things that our cloud and other vendors' cloud have. So. Um, I think that's really the sweet spot. So again, covering this real quick is augmentation. There's some you know pluses and minus. Um, I'm reducing, kind of offloading the mainframe. You think about that. It's very quick to do. Again, <clears throat> with AWS, with other companies, there's plenty of tools and partners there to help, right? Um, uh, there's lots of different tools for partners for emulation as well. And there's different types of emulation. So there's like you know, easy, you know, LZ Labs has like a lift, tinker, and shift versus uh, microfocus, right? So there's different ways to emulate, but you have a lot of choices there, and that's really good to have. Um, and then, you know, automated refactoring is you are going to have a cloud native solution that's 100% cloud native at the end. Um, and it's a similar effort to emulation, so why not go cloud native? So, uh, Real quick, here's some of the, <clears throat> the vendors that um, we work with that are um, providing these tool tools out there. Um, we have um, immersion days, if you've participated in some of that, where we walk through things like Blue Age, right? Um, uh, you know, there's the middleware emulation technology as well as the augmentation, right? Um, personally, I've worked with Click um, on a augmentation and it's, um, you know, again, all this stuff, all these vendors are great. It's just picking the right one for your use case. So I'm gonna cover a success story that I worked on with a large financial company, um, financial services company um, in this uh, Pennsylvania area. So, um, but basically, you know, the, the, the net net of the converse, of the discussion was, is they had a consumer facing website, um, you know, financial website where they're placing stock orders, et cetera. Um, if you're familiar with market events, like the stock market goes way up, goes way down in one day. Um, the the website was calling directly to DB2 hosted, mainframe hosted DB2 stored procs, right? So you logged in, you got your portfolio, um, lots of read-only type of stuff, right? 
every single time that it was calling that, it was calling a store proc and just slaughtering <clears throat> the, the system, running up MIPS cost, et cetera. Um, they needed to reduce that. So they work with AWS, with our professional services group. Um, and the solution was, was, again, that augmentation approach was, let's replicate the data from on-prem, on from the mainframe to RDS, DMODB, so our structured and unstructured data approach through change data capture. Um, some microservices, uh, they built microservices in Java that will be placed near the user, so global if there's financial data that a user in Japan needs to access versus going to a mainframe that's hosted in um, the Pennsylvania region, we can replicate that data to the Osaka, new Osaka region, and they get their data instantaneously, right? right? So the the global nature of that, um, you, you can't do that with a mainframe, you can do that with a cloud. Again, it was, again, mostly read only. Um, there was some read write, but that was very limited, as I mentioned a little bit earlier. And again, the benefits, like what app, what's in it for me, they really dropped a lot of costs, like just, just taking those kind of unnecessary repeat read transactions out was uh, super, super helpful. Um, you know, the application maintenance was now AWS application. It was, it's literally was code running in Lambda that was serverless. I didn't have to provision, I didn't have to worry about it. It just ran. Um, and when they get hammered by a market event, you know what happens? Lambda scale up, DynamoDB scales up, and no one knows the difference, right? Um, the, late, the mainframe is still the system of record, so all writes go back to that, all transactions go back to that, but being able to reduce the, the read traffic to that was a, was a huge benefit for everyone. So um, there are some YouTube links there you can watch, so um, we don't have time to watch them now, but take a, take a, take a gander at watching some of those. Um, so, hey, John? Yeah. John, it's Ron Gerber. A couple of things. I know the client here, and we do have some great YouTubes on our Angel Beat site describing this specific advantage. So make sure Excellent. you make sure we follow up on that. We are just about out of time, John. So uh, if there's anything else, we've got your contact information. 